All right, moving on. Uh, uh, so now we're going to start looking at the concept of Christological heresies. And we spent a lot of time on the concept of heresies and prolegomena. We looked at Trinitarian heresies, uh, the concept of Unitarianism and modalism and tritheism, uh, in contrast, for example, with the doctrine of the Trinity. But now we're looking at, you know, we've established that for Christological orthodoxy, again, which is a, this was done, you know, roughly 1,700 years ago. True God, true man, one person, divine and human natures remain distinct. So what are the false competing Christologies? And like with the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, uh, people invent falsehoods, uh, usually because, no, my, the orthodox view of Christ seems incoherent to me, therefore I'm going to leave out A, B, C, or D in my formulation so it's going to seem more coherent for me. So remember, most heresies suffer from the fact that they're incomplete statements based on the fact that people think that it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy their individual idea of rationality or coherency. So, as with all the Christological heresies, they're going to fit one of those four categories of orthodoxy with respect to rejection. It's either going to be a denial of the deity of Christ, the denial somehow of the humanity of Christ, a denial of the unipersonality of Christ, or a denial of the distinct natures of Christ. Okay? So every single one of these, again, is going to relate to one of those four criteria. So let's just start at the beginning. Classically, uh, again, there was an early Jewish heresy called Ebionism, which was more of a historical note where they thought Jesus was the Messiah, but that he was simply, again, a mere human being. So very similar to the next one on the list, and we're roughly on page six of your Christology Part 1 uh, syllabus or handout. Roughly the ancient version of what in more modern times is called dynamic monarchianism. Okay? Now what's dynamic monarchianism? That's easy. It's monarchianism that's dynamic. Okay? I know you're not laughing, but okay, good. So that's the, by the way, that's the contrast between modalistic monarchianism, which was a Trinitarian heresy. This is a Christological heresy, dynamic monarchianism. So again, monarchianism is the idea you've got one and only one person who is God. In modalistic monarchianism, what you've got is the one person is that now functioned or displays himself in different modes or roles at different times or in different ways, but it's still only one person. Dynamic monarchianism, the foundation of it is the dunamis, which is the Greek word for power. So here, dynamic monarchianism, which is probably um, the, the most frequently held view in progressive or modernist churches, is that Christ is only and merely a human being, but he's empowered by God, okay, the dunamis, he's empowered by God, or receives divine power for him to fulfill his ministry. So again, this is one that rejects the deity of Christ. So uh, now, by the way, too, when, you, when we start looking at Christological heresies, there are going to be some that come from those who tend to have a lower view of the inspiration and authority of Scripture, and those that tend to have a little bit higher view of the inspiration and authority of Scripture. Those that tend to reduce Jesus to only being a human being, uh, again, tend to, you know, again, like modernism, uh, generally are those that would really reject the inspiration and authority of the Bible in the traditional sense. So they're saying, well, what makes sense? Well, Jesus was a sinless prophet or a great ethicist. But those that take inspiration and inerrancy uh, a bit more seriously but still can't stomach uh, Chalcedonian orthodoxy, these would be folks like the classic Arians, okay? That's A-R-I-A-N, not A-R-Y-A-N. We're talking, not talking about white supremacy here. So the Arians are those, again, historically, if you've taken this in your historical theology class, uh, Arius basically popularized the teaching that there is a cre the, the logos mentioned in John one is created. He's the created son logos. While he's powerful, he's greater than any other created being. He's still the first and greatest creation of God, the most powerful of God's creation. So he's the created son logos. Now the modern Arians, like the Jehovah Witnesses. Again, would take that further and just say, yeah, he's the created son Logos. He is Michael the Archangel, the first and greatest of God's creation. Now, why kick it back a notch from 
Jesus is just uh, a sinless human being to he's a, you know, the Logos is a, the first of God's created mutable beings and is the most powerful. The answer is because it's just crystal clear in Scripture, looking at texts like the Gospel of John chapter 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, oops, right? But the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, John 1, 14, and we beheld His glory. So the Bible clearly in many places has this Son Logos existing as a person before the Incarnation. So this is why Arians, who tend to have, a, again, a higher view of inspiration and inerrancy, but then superimpose their own view of, quote, rationality, rationality or coherency on the text uh, and the concept, st again, hold to what they hold. So these are, are the primary heresies that would reject the deity of Christ. Okay? So then moving along, then we have a number of heresies um, that would reject the full humanity of Christ, and that is, again, we've established what full humanity is in, uh, again, what full humanity is in uh, our anthropology section. Again, created, finite, contingent, mutable, okay? Physical substance exemplified by the body. Again, human soul or spirit, non-physical substance in which, uh, again, our rational faculties are grounded, intellect, will, and emotions, heart, all of that created finite contingent, those together, again, are going to make substance dualism complete human nature. So with Christ, again, he's fully God, full divine person, and the incarnation, as we'll talk about this, the same issues uh, we talked about with origin of the soul, things like that. What is clear is Christ seems to get his physical body from Mary, but the question becomes, where does he get his soul? That becomes a division and discussion in the church. But I have an entire handout that you, we're going to look at a little bit later on Apollinarianism. Uh, and essentially, Apollinarianism, uh, in its original form, taught that Christ's human soul in the Incarnation is replaced by the divine Logos in their view of the human constitution. Now, Apollinaris, uh, again, came from the school of Alexandria. He was a trichotomist. So what we end up with is the human soul or spirit, depending on who you read. But whatever part is ground is the ground of the rational faculties in Christ, Christ does not have that in his human nature. Okay? So what you've got now is merely the Logos. And so uh, in some of its more modern incarnations, Apollinarianism, uh, we have a more mutable second person of the Trinity, uh, and that mutable second person of the Trinity by the divine nature is now exemplifying uh, a human soul and functioning as a human cell along with functioning as God. And now what you've got to complete the incarnation is the addition of a hominid body. Okay. Now again, these ideas were rejected by Chalcedon because again, that uh, again the entire church is saying that he's, he's complete in manhood, perfect, complete, lacking nothing in manhood which is why it adds the words, of a reasonable or rational soul. That was actually against the Apollinarians. So all of that to say is that uh, when we see the person of Christ doing the kinds of soulish functions that a human being would do, like uh, expressing ignorance, okay, who touched me, or that it says in, in the growth narratives in Luke that uh, he grew in wisdom, right, and, and strength and in favor with God and man. Well, again, it, without a human soul, there's a lot of things he can't do, and I have a whole handout on this. We'll talk about this when we get to our, uh, our discussion time more fully. But again, uh, how Christ is going to die spiritually, how Christ is going to grow in wisdom, how Christ is going to be tempted, since, of course, the Bible says God can't be tempted, yet Christ was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. All of that requires an actual created, finite, mutable, growable human soul, okay? which again, which is why Apollinarianism was rejected at the Council of Chalcedon. So in that sense, it rejects full humanity because it rejects the notion that Christ has a human soul. Uh, the concept, the next heresy, the idea of docetic Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism was, uh, there are various forms of it, but one of the, one of the forms of Gnosticism was that you, you have this distant uh, distance God, and the, 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 the entire material or physical world was created by this, uh, again, this deity, okay? And that the goal of human, see, our spark 
of uh, who we are, of our soul, is trapped in this evil physical world. So the goal, of course, is to get it, get away from and get rid of our, our attachment to the physical world and get back to this spirit good God. Now, of course, so in the docetic Gnostic view of Christ, the word dokain in, in Greek means to seem or to appear. The argument is, is that Christ only seemed to or appeared to have an actual body, okay? Why? But, but, but the, see, the Redeemer would never actually take on a physical body, according to the, the Docetists, because that would have corrupted him. So he only seemed or appeared to have a body. And again, when we get to the humanity of Christ in further lectures, we'll give the evidence for, of course, why Christ had a human body, born of a woman, born under the law, and so forth. You know, who touched me? Stop clinging to me, so on and so forth. There's just no good reason scripturally to reject the idea that Christ had a physical body. Then we move on to some of the ideas where Christ is uh, uh, separated into two persons, and that's Nestorianism, as it's classically called. There's at least some debates now in historical theology on whether or not uh, Nestorius was actually a Nestorian, or whether he just followed a, an actual like an Antiochian Christology that emphasized the integrity of natures. But that said, that the the, the, the Heresy of Nestorianism, as it's called, is simply that Christ is two persons. There's one person who is the, the, human, the full human being, Jesus Christ, body, soul, spirit, self-aware uh, in his own humanity. He's one person and one subsistent. And then uh, he's also, the Logos is a person or subsistent, and those two come together, arguably not for an incarnation, but for a mere indwelling. You have one person indwelling a second person, the man Jesus. Now, in that case, again, you just don't have an incarnation of the Son of God. What you have is the indwelling of a sinless prophet, a, hu a human being. And by the way, if that's what makes Jesus God, the fact that he's indwelt by God, that makes all of, all of, all of us other Christians, we're all God too because we're indwelt by God. So again, it's, it's more than that. And again, that's why Nestorianism is rejected, uh, again, in Chalcedon, because he does, in fact, claimed to be one person all throughout the New Testament after the Incarnation. So, uh, finally, our last couple here of our Christological heresies violate the concept of two distinct natures. I mentioned that earlier, uh, Eutychianism and, and Monophysitism. And again, this is just the blending of the two natures into one, which leads to just confusion and conflict. So those are the the classic Christological heresies to sort of be aware of and watch out for, because all of them reject one or more of those four Chalcedonian criteria. Thanks. See you in the next segment.